special about the University of Illinois, of course, is I have such deep roots here, having lived here for 10 years and gone to school here, worked here, had my children born here. And so it's very special for me to come back. The fact that the University of Illinois Press is publishing our third book and distributing our first two books, the fact that we're doing it, my company was doing the student ID cards for the university, uh, how can that not be special? The University of Illinois is a land-grant institution, and it's always been part of our mission to help educate. I think the original uh, land-grant act essentially says children of working-class families. Uh, that's, that's part of who we are, it's part of what we do. So that's exactly the goal of the Give Something Back Foundation, and, and we're just delighted to be partnering with Give Something Back. What's really different about our kids, and I think that people in the audience are gonna see that firsthand today, is that they've gone through really tough times. They've had to figure out how to cope with the most difficult challenges in their lives, and they've been able to do that. And having those skills in the real world when you're an adult is invaluable. I always felt like I had a little bit of an advantage in the business world because I understood how normal people thought, <laughs> not, just, uh, you know, not just the elites. And so I think it's a tremendous advantage for a great school like Illinois to bring in more and more of these kids who basically are growing up in poverty and they can bring those experiences and educate the other students who have no experience with it. I think a lot of higher ed, especially at the most selective schools, um, can easily become the province of children of pretty well-to-do families. That's who can afford to do it. That's who had, uh, you know, tended to go to really great high schools with lots of opportunities and to the extent that those kids are here at Illinois it's great for them to meet somebody who, who didn't uh, come from that kind of background but who's just as bright just as smart and hard-working as they are and understand what that life is like. We are here to celebrate a major gift to the University and the beginning, a uh, formal beginning of a partnership between the Give Something Back Foundation and the University of Illinois. This is a particularly uh, special celebration um, because the gift is going to benefit many deserving students because uh, the work of Give Something Back Foundation is just beautifully aligned with the University of Illinois' mission as a land-grant institution to provide higher education to everyone, and uh, because the gift comes from one of our own, uh, double alum, Bob Carr. Uh, it's also particularly nice to be doing this on Giving Tuesday, which is a national day to recognize philanthropy, so good timing on that. Um, Give Something Back has been uh, up and running for quite some time, I think about 13 years, sounds right, Bob? very successfully, and um, over the last uh, oh, eight or nine months, I've had a chance to work with Bob and with the foundation. And I have to tell you that I am truly impressed by Bob's understanding and the foundation's work in uh, digging in and developing uh, a really deep understanding of what it means for young people, particularly from working class families, to go to college what are the obstacles they face? What are the challenges? What are the pitfalls? What are the benefits? And uh, then uh, with that good understanding of the reality, tailoring a program that really works. It works for students. It works for the institution. I think it makes a substantial difference in our country and in our world. And I don't think in my years of higher ed I've ever encountered a, a donor or a foundation that was more knowledgeable and, and more aware of uh, that mission and more effective in pursuing it. So my hat's off to you guys. While today marks the formal beginning of the partnership between Give Something Back and the university, uh, Give Something Back scholars have been coming to the U of I since almost the beginning of the program. And so over those 13 years, there have been 22 students here, uh, nine current students, 13 graduates. Um, that's uh, uh, for the students who have had four years here, that's a 100% graduation rate and 100% post-college employment rate um, in this program. So uh, I think that's the envy of almost anybody. I said to Bob, a little higher, Bob, a little higher. But, um, hard to beat that. 
A um, number of those students are present today and some alums too. Could I just ask uh, all of you who are either give something back, current students or alums to stand so we can see who you are and just make sure we know, all right? Great, glad to have you all here. Okay. Thank you. Yep, yep, alums, yep, good. Okay. There are all your kids there. Uh, and uh, it's now my pleasure to introduce uh, two of them to you uh, to talk about their own experiences in their, in their own words. Uh, Shannon Kegel is the U of I class of 2007. Uh, she graduated with a double major in psychology and English. She's currently an attorney for Harris Tax Law in Chicago. And following Shannon will be Alberto Davila, who's a senior in aerospace engineering and who's been with Give Something Back since the seventh grade, made an early start there. So uh, Shannon first, please. Well, U of I is just, it's a phenomenal university and Give Something Back Foundation already sets these students up with a really nice opportunity. What I think U of I does is it kind of creates the possibilities, the possibilities to sort of explore, I mean, any, any career, any topic of interest. I mean, a university like this, you know, you can change your mind 20 times. You're never gonna pick a bad major or a bad program at the University of Illinois. And then of course, on top of the fact that it's a top-notch school when it comes to scholastics. There's just a lot of social opportunities and growth for these students. And I find that um, the diversity on campus, um, both um, you know, race, culture, and socioeconomic is something that you're just not gonna get on every campus. I mean, you have 40,000 students that come from all different types of backgrounds. And I find that's something really comforting about the University of Illinois. These students are gonna find people that they're able to connect with in a way that maybe they've never connected with, you know, ever before. Hi, my name is Shannon Kegel, and I'm proud to say that I am a Give Something Back Foundation and University of Illinois alum. To understand how much that means to me, I think that it's important that I share a little bit of my backstory. I came from a single family home with four siblings. My mom raised us on our own. While there was a lot of love in our family, one thing we always struggled with was money. There just never seemed to be enough to pay for all the bills. For that reason, for a large part of my childhood, we really relied on family and friends. There were periods in my life where I lived in extra rooms in aunts and uncles' homes, a basement of a close family friend. When I was really young, my view on how I was gonna improve things for my family was, um, a little bit young as well. I thought the lottery. I thought I'm gonna be a treasure hunter. I had read something that there's millions of undiscovered gold at the bottom of the ocean. This was my way of thinking of turning things around. Obviously, as I got older, junior high, high school, I started to think maybe education is the way to make this happen maybe a career, a profession, that this might be the more realistic approach to see a difference for myself and for my family. When I became old enough to start thinking about going to college, it was a scary time for my family. I am part of a first generation group that went to school, uh, myself and two other siblings, and it was a very foreign process for our family. We didn't know anything about FOSFA. We hadn't any experience with ACT prep courses, Visiting colleges, campuses, wasn't an option for us. We didn't have a reliable car. My mom didn't have the money to do that sort of thing. My first visit to the University of Illinois actually did not happen until after I had been both accepted and admitted into the university. Fortunately, it was an excellent fit, but that's one of the things that I love so much about the Give Something Back Foundation. Obviously, the foundation alleviates a huge financial burden and stress on not just the student, but also these families. But there's also the mentoring programs. There's also the workshops on how to navigate FOSFA. There's also help and resources with the ACTs, and there's student visits. The scholarship program does give the students the opportunity over the summer to visit the different universities and find out what's a good fit. I can't say how much demystifying that process and making it easier for the families financially and just navigating that really confusing process helps these families and not just the student that receives the actual gift. A lot of these 
students have siblings, cousins, family that have never gone through this process before, sometimes all it takes is one to break that barrier, knock down that gate, and to make this seem like something possible. And on that note, I'd like to share a personal story. When I was a sophomore in college, my high school sweetheart approached me and said he was thinking of going to school, uh, to college. He had spoken to his mother about it, and she had told him that their family are blue-collar workers. College isn't for them. And I remember at the time, I know she loves him. I know she didn't mean it the way she had said it, but this is some of the barriers that these students are going through. And I'm proud to say that I know for a fact that that man went to school and got a degree. And the reason I know that is because I'm currently married to him today. And we have a two-year-old daughter. And I know no one will ever tell her college isn't for her. This breaks barriers. This makes a difference for students, families, and generations beyond the student that receives the gift. So when I found out that 50 students, 50 families, were going to have an opportunity to come to the University of Illinois. It was a very emotional moment for me. This is going to make a difference to these families, and the Give Something Back Foundation already gives so many tools and resources to help these students to succeed and to help them build their confidence and find their strengths. And when you pair that with a university, like the University of Illinois, I really believe we're going to see some amazing things from these students. You've got a phenomenal campus here, wonderful professors. Some of the best lessons I learned came from this campus. I still remember my race and culture class and how that changed my view on things. And I know that these students, these smart, hardworking, resilient students are going to take the gifts from the Give Something Back Foundation and the university and make a difference, not just in their own lives, but in their families, in their communities, in their workplaces. So I'd like to take another opportunity to thank the people who've made a difference in my life, my family, the Give Something Back Foundation, the University of Illinois. I'm where I'm at today because of them. I am working as an attorney in the city of Chicago. I am very happy. My husband, my daughter, we're living in Lockport, and I still have the honor and the privilege to work as a mentor with the Give Something Back Foundation. I get to see a student go through this program and have this chance, this opportunity to make a difference. And I can't say what it means to me. I've been asked before, what does the Give Something Back Foundation mean to me? And it's changed throughout the years. It's never just one thing. When I was a freshman and sophomore in college, it was a financial relief on myself and my family, an opportunity to go through college and focus on my studies and the social opportunities and the experiences and learn about myself. And it's changed, it's evolved as I've worked through the program. For me right now, it's an inspiration. It's an inspiration to do more, to give back. I know Bob has said it before. I do feel like the thing that the foundation leaves all of the graduates, all of the alum with, is a desire to give 100%, whatever you're doing, in your families, in your communities, in your profession. You have a responsibility and an opportunity to do that, and I feel that you're gonna see that with these 50 students. They are not gonna disappoint. They're gonna make a difference. So I'd like to say thank you again. To me, what it means to give back is to give whatever you can, whether it be financial or you know just volunteering or whatever means you have to and put that effort or whatever it may be into a cause that you firmly believe in that is benefiting others. You have in no way whatsoever does it benefit you other than that you know you feel better as a person that you help someone else out. And that to me is what the definition of giving back is. Within my extended family, I am the, I am the first to go to college. Um, I've, I have a couple cousins after hearing that I had been admitted here that began associate's degrees in smaller community colleges. However, I am the one to go to a big university to achieve the bachelor's degree. Ideally, I would work in the aerospace industry. Um, I have a, a, a passion that has been there since early on, and I knew to, to become successful in the industry and even become a part of the industry, you would need uh, college education, hence uh, 
achieve, getting into college becoming my number one priority when I was young. Um, and now having almost completed uh, my aerospace degree here, I plan on going out into the industry and um, doing the best I can there so that I too can accumulate enough wealth or you know in my spare time give back to the community. Um, yeah my mother she was very hard working she still is and she inspired me she reminded me every day that essentially that she was doing this from for us from for the family and uh, to me that is uh, that has been one of the primary um, motivators that has gotten me through um, through my education and I wake up every day thinking about that. Good morning everyone. My name is Alberto Davila and I am a senior here at the U of I studying aerospace engineering and current recipient of the Give Something Back Foundation. I chose this school because of its renowned engineering program and the scholarships offered to me at the time. In removing the financial burden that is associated with higher education, I have been able to take full advantage of the experiences and opportunities offered here at the university. Over the past years, I have been a member of the Society of Hispanic Professional Engineers, the American Institute for Aeronautics and, uh, and uh, Astronautics, and the Delta Kappa Epsilon Fraternity Delta Pi Chapter member. I have played various roles on campus. I have been vice president of my freshman class for the Society of Hispanic Professional Engineers. Uh, I have also been a founding uh, father of the um, Delta Kappa Epsilon Fraternity Delta Pi Chapter here on campus. And I hope to come back as an alum and see the impact I have made on this campus. I was born in Chicago and my parents moved out to, to Arizona when I was about three. It was in Arizona where I spent most of my childhood, spending, most, spending what seemed to be an eternity outdoors on my, on my father's ranch in the outskirts of Phoenix. It was here where I developed my love for engineering. I remember having various uh, construction projects in the backyard testing out the strength of my dirt overpasses. Um, I was not at an age of understanding of what financial difficulty was until we moved back to Illinois. It was here that my mother had to leave me in charge of the home and go work in the warehouses in Joliet. Even having both parents working, my family found it difficult to make ends meet. Had it not been for the help of my grandfather, we would have easily lost our home back in 2008. I recall my, prim my mother's primary motivation every day was to keep us in what she thought was one of the finest school districts in the state. Contrary to what my father would tell her, she would not move out to the rougher parts of Chicago and at the end we would keep our humble home in Crest Hill. Alas, it was through this gentle reminder that I knew that the fate of my education was in my hands. I was not going to let my hardworking mother's efforts go to waste. And so I used this motivation to do the best I could in school. I was also aware that the steps I took at that time would echo into my future. It was this awareness and academic effort that made me eligible for various scholarships from the university and from the Give Something Back Foundation. These scholarships have been vital to my education and remind me that they are generous, caring donors that want to invest in my aspirations and see students like myself succeed. To this day, I recognize the economic hardships that I had to endure to be where I am at today. These hardships have been one of my primary motivators to continue delivering the best quality work I can academically and to better myself as a person. I am also extremely happy and heart touched to hear that Bob Carr is offering 50 more students 
the opportunity to pursue their dreams here at the University of Illinois. I hope to one day follow his and many other alumni's footsteps and donate to the University Scholarship Fund or to the Give Something Back Foundation. More importantly, I hope that the kid whose parents also sacrificed the most that they could so that they could better their children's education will receive the same support that I have received so that they too can follow their dream. Thank you. Thank you so much, Alberto and Shannon. Um, the Give Something Back folks have compiled profiles of all the U of I Give Something Back scholars so far today. They are, are printed on, on your table, uh, and you can so you can read a little more about Alberto and Shannon and, and some of the many other wonderful students that this program has helped bring to this university. Uh, it's now my pleasure to introduce our chancellor, Dr. Robert J. Jones. Uh, Dr. Jones is the new kid on the block, having started here in, in September. So I don't know, does that make you a freshman, Chancellor Jones? Yeah, freshman, okay, all right. Uh, as chancellor, he is the chief executive officer of the campus. It's a big job, but uh, relevant to today, he could just as well have been a Give Something Back student uh, had that program been around, around when he was uh, young in high school and headed for college. Uh, Dr. Jones grew up on a farm in Georgia, uh, working in the fields, even as a child. And um, he did manage to go to college, then to graduate school. Had a very successful 34-year career as a faculty member at the University of Minnesota. If you want to know something about crop science, plant physiology, he's your guy. Uh, he also uh, took on administrative positions there at Minnesota, including senior vice president of academic affairs then became the president of U the University of Albany, uh, which, by the way, the Give Something Back Foundation has started to work with. So um, apparently they, the Albany people need you to give them a call, give, give them the scouting report, something about that. Um, but we were lucky enough to recruit him here this year to be our chancellor, Chancellor Jones. Thank you, Provost Tucker. And I also want to echo my very strong welcome to each and every one of you to this um, historic and highly important event and also this celebration. And of course, it is my great honor to welcome back our alum, Bob Carr. And let's give Bob and the foundation another round of applause. I, I just think it's very well warranted. And the foundation and your gift will be opening up doors and opportunities for Illinois students for generations to come. And it's particularly appropriate, as Chuck said earlier, that we celebrate this event on this Giving Tuesday. And another thing Chuck uh, said that uh, is absolutely true, I certainly wish that uh, uh, the giving, Give Something Back Foundation and person like Bob Carr was around in the late 19, whatchamacallit, something like that. Uh, it would have made a difference, and this son of a sharecropper from southwestern Georgia, maybe I would have only had to work maybe five jobs rather than eight jobs to work my way through college. So, Bob, I can tell you, this day, this event is a stark reminder for, for me in terms of why education is so critically important. It was the life changer, the game changer for me because there's no reason why a son of a sharecropper should be standing here before you as the chancellor of one of the greatest land grant universities in the country. It was only through education and those that made it possible for me to pursue an education at the undergraduate level at Fort Valley State College and Fort Valley, Georgia, and to get a small scholarship, uh, Bob, it wasn't quite as small as the one that you received, but it goes to show what a, what a little bit of money can inspire a person with a good heart to do that changes the lives of others. And so I, I really felt compelled to say that on the front end of the rest of, of my comments. So uh, we are very, very thankful again for the work that you and the foundation have done across the country to make college education accessible, attainable, and affordable to students and their families. 
Uh, but let me be clear, nothing I can say, not even the bit of my personal perspective that I shared with you, can be more powerful, normal, elegant than the stories you just heard from Shannon and Alberto. And I think we need to give these folks a round of applause as well. <laughs> these scholarships and all of the support that's provided through the, the mentoring uh, represents a real chance for students like Shannon and Alberto to realize the American dream of going to college, finding a career, and having a experience that will be life-changing and allow them to lead an impactful and fulfilled life. And as W.D. Boyce once said, of all the fundamental human rights, the civil rights that people have died for and fought for for hundreds of years, there's nothing more fundamental than the opportunity to pursue an education. And for far too many people still today in our society, that's an opportunity that's out of reach, not for lack of out effort, not for lack of talent, nor hard work, but rather because they were born under difficult and challenging economic circumstances. So access to a college education, and particularly a education at a world-class land-grant university, cannot be limited by the ability to pay, and your career path shouldn't be determined by how much debt you must repay. It should be only limited by, uh, by your willingness and your courage and your desire to learn. Endowments like the one that Bob and Give Something Back have established here are really, from my perspective, the real embodiment of the land-grant mission a mission that has served this state and this nation for more than 150 years. So in short, it puts an Illinois education in reach and puts your career choices in your hands, the students that will be receiving this scholarship and having the opportunity to attend this great university. And the long term, it is a model, it is inspirational, and it's a reminder of just how much impact the generosity of one person and one group can have on the lives of others. Look where that simple act has led to today. So Bob, on behalf of this entire community, I want to thank you and give Something Back Foundation for your confidence and the trust that you placed in this great university. And I can assure you, we will make sure that each and every one of your scholars have the mentoring, the support, and the outstanding educational experience that will truly transform their lives. And I know they will go out to also give something back to help uplift future generations. So again, thank you so much. And I can't say take my seat without saying thank you for going back to my old university and engaging them. I think you will find it an amazing place that are deeply committed to the values that allow you to create this great scholarship support. So thank you so much for doing that. It is my great honor to meet you and my great honor to be part of this important celebration. Thank you so much. Thank you, Chancellor Jones. Um, I think you've already learned the most important things about Bob Carr, but let me say a few words of introduction. Um, Bob is an alum having earned a Bachelor of Science in Mathematics in 1966 and a Master of Science in Math and Computer Science in 1967. Um, I guess I'm also going to give a shout out to uh, Tom Ramage, president of Parkland College, who's here with us today because uh, Bob's next job was to go to Parkland College and, and work there. Um, and uh, that's another partnership that Gives Something Back is actively exploring and we're eager to, to be part of that as well. Um, you've heard about the, the scholarship, the $250 scholarship. Wonder if the Lockport Women's Club had any idea what they were going to get for their money. Um, but uh, Bob founded Heartland Payment Systems. It's a Fortune 1000 payment processing company and technology provider based in Princeton. And I learned today uh, that Bob has yet another very uh, important and intimate connection with the University of Illinois. 
Heartland payment system is the people who provide the iCards. Um, so every, every uh, faculty, every, every student and faculty and staff member at the university has one of these uh, University of Illinois iCards. And um, uh, I'm, I'm glad that you, you know, like got out of the company, sold the company before you started with us and we don't have any conflict of interest questions. Um, <laughs> but now every time I pull out my iCard, I'm gonna think about, think about Bob. Um, Bob was also served on the uh, President's uh, National Infrastructure Advisory Council, which uh, works with the uh, U.S. Uh, Secretary of Homeland Security and advises the President on nat national infrastructure. He's written uh, two books um, so far. One, uh, Through the Fires, an American Story of Turbulence, Business, Triumph, and Giving Back is, I guess that's the autobiography, Bob, right? And uh, then a book which is just being released this spring, Working Class to College, The Promise and Peril of Blue Collar America, will be released next spring. But both books are available here. And um, if you're interested, we hope you'll take a copy with you on the way out. So Bob, please. Well, I joked about keeping this under two hours. I'm not sure I can do that, though, <laughs> but I will. <laughs> There's so much I, I do want to say. Uh, Champaign-Urbana was the place I came to when I escaped from a pretty miserable place um, in my home. And I came here as a 17-year-old. And I, lived, I stayed here 10 years and left when I was 27, not because it took me 10 years to get through college, but basically I was starting you know, my adult life here. And um, it was a really amazing and wonderful time. I started my company here. Uh, I adopted my oldest child while living here. My son was born here. Um, a lot happened in, in Champaign-Urbana and the reason I live in Princeton, quite frankly, is because I could move anywhere I wanted to move. And I wanted to be in a university town because of my wonderful experience in Champaign-Urbana. But I also wanted to live near New York, the financial heartbeat of the country. And it worked out pretty darn well. Um, I couldn't be more pleased than to be able to do what I do. My life's work has become this. Uh, I do have business interests, but the business interests exist so that we can do more of this kind of thing around the country. And I have a number of really significant goals. Uh, they're significant, I think, to me as well as to the country. Uh, my book, Working Class to College, and by the way, you're all welcome to pick up one copy of each book, and if we'd run out of them, leave your business card and we'll send you one compliments of the foundation. Uh, the second book, Working Class to College, The, the Promise and Peril for Blue Collar America, identifies one of the major problems we have in this country that's not talked about. And that is that there are 40 million Americans who have started college and not finished it. And Dirk, my co-author, where's Dirk? Dirk, please stand, Dirk. Here's a great man right here, Dirk Johnson. Let's thank him. <laughs> Uh, Dirk and I worked really hard on the first book, um, which is more than an autobiography. It's a book about the business. It's a book about the foundation, and about it is a, about me as well. The second book, Working Class to College, which, by the way, both of our books are being distributed by the University of Illinois Press. The University of Illinois Press has asked us not to do anything to sell the book, uh, Working Class to College, until March. They're trying to get it into some bookstores and so on. Um, and, and Dirk and I are working on a third book now, which we just decided to call working title is The, the uh, Unseen Victims of Crime. And those are the children of incarcerated parents. Um, one of my goals is to um, really talk through how it is that 40 million Americans, most of which have college debt and no degree, why that has happened. It's a tragedy. It's a just wrong thing to happen. There's a whole lot of combination, there's a combination of all kinds of reasons for it. Many by very well-intentioned people who aren't forthright, forthcoming, or knowledgeable enough to be advising students on what to do. There are programs all over the country where scholarships are promised and not funded. 
The reason we're putting a million dollars into the, we have put a million dollars into the University of Illinois is God forbid something happens to our organization. The money is here. We're making a promise to kids now. You're gonna to go to college for free and we don't have to worry about raising that money. And that's the way we've been doing it right from the beginning. And it's something I'm really proud of. I think people who make promises should be damn sure to fulfill them. And that's exactly what we're doing. And we, I want for students to understand that a $2,000 discount to their tuition as a freshman to play on the lacrosse team is a real disaster. If you're thinking you're going to go through college and have lacrosse you know, uh, be your vehicle for, for, for financing it, you're, you're wrong. And why does a school do something like that? They do that so that the student's parents can brag about how his daughter or son got a, got a scholarship, an athletic scholarship, but when it really is a means to have them select a certain school so that the, 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 uh, the rest of the money can be, can be paid in. There, there's many, many things like that, most of which are done by well-intentional, well-intentioned, but uninformed people. Our kids are all gonna go through school as long as they do their part of it. They don't have to worry about the money being there. Another thing that we wanna do is to go deeper and deeper into the neediest of kids. When I was here, I'm a simple-minded guy in a lot of ways. When I was here at the university, I took a course, Philosophy 102, which is an ethics course. And very simple, somewhere halfway through that course, we read St John Stuart Mill's books and talked about the utilitarian principle, which is basically the quality of a life is measured in part by how much you do to help in the best ways to, for the most people. I can't think of a better way to do valuable things than to use my fortunate uh, situation to help the neediest of kids in the best possible way. We know that education is the, is the way to break the cycle of poverty. It's also the way to break the cycle of incarceration. And so thanks to Rebecca Ginsburg, who's here. Rebecca, raise your hand. Uh, Dirk met um, a uh, inmate, uh, uh, an incarcerated uh, man in Danville. And Rebecca came up and met with me at uh, St. Francis University. I don't know how long ago that was, Rebecca. It seems like it was a long time ago. And I said, Rebecca, how would we find these students of in incarcerated parents? Because the, you know, the, the state prisons, you know, the, 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 they're from, the prisoners are from all over the state. And she said, just stand up, Bob, and look around. We were in the cafeteria at the University of St. Francis in Joliet. She said, there are more than a few children of incarcerated parents. And that got us on to this topic. And now um, we are, I'm pleased to introduce Deborah from the DCFS in Chicago. Where's Deborah? She's here somewhere also. There she is right there. Um, we're gonna work with DCFS, which manages the foster children in the state of Illinois, many of whom have children uh, who have parents in jail in prison. So we want to call attention to, these are the neediest kids out there. Who is in worse shape than a kid who has a parent in prison? It's not their fault, uh, and especially if it's a mom. A lot of these kids grow up without a dad in their home. The kid who has an incarcerated father has a 19% has a chance of going through college, which is you know, pretty bad, but mothers, 2%. When the mother is pulled out of the home and sent to prison, that child's life collapses. And it's really, really difficult to bring it back. So in a perfect world, all of our money in the future would go to these 150,000 children who have an incarcerated mom or who have had an incarcerated mom. And we would get them through college. And I know we can get them through college if we catch them early enough. The program that we have with the University of Illinois and with other universities throughout the country is a great program. It works incredibly well. But we also know just with a little bit of work that we've done in South New Jersey near Camden, that if we catch these kids early enough and tell them that they're gonna, have a, they're gonna go to college, that the money's in the bank to pay for their college, which it is, 
then they're going to ch that changes their whole attitude about life at a very early age. And already we are seeing an improved in, improvement in the grade point averages of these kids that are still in elementary or junior high because now they're paying attention. And we coach them to take more difficult classes once they get into high school. So when they graduate from high school, they're going to be able to attend a great school like the University of Illinois because they've taken calculus, they've taken AP history, et cetera, et cetera. And if, they have, if they're not in a position to do that, we can help them with remediation. And um, so, so those are two of the missions that we're on. Uh, we are not going to be able to solve the problem for 150,000 uh, kids, but we're going to work at it, and hopefully we're going to be able to have enough success in our program, continue to have enough success in our program, that we're going to be able to help with the help of many of you, the state legislatures to change the way they allocate money for prisons and for these kids. It's just upside down and wrong, and it, it's fixable. It is a fixable problem with the right educational partners, and that's one of our missions. So my story is um, really not very relevant anymore <laughs> it, to, to me in terms of um, what we're about to do. Um, one of the things, you know, Heartland, my, the company that was, went public and was sold just this past April, uh, it started off as an organization called Robert Carr and Associates right here in Champaign on Neal Street. Uh, and it morphed over the years as computers changed over the years. Uh, my business changed. It went from mainframes to software development and services to mini computers to microcomputers to cell phones and continues to morph. We became the fifth largest payment processor in the country and a $1,000 investment in 1997, I, I have a hard time believing that what I'm about to tell you is really true, but it is true. A $1,000 investment in 1997 in this company was worth $2.15 million on, in April when the company was sold, which is a, an, an amazing success story because we were in the right place at the right time. When I came to Champaign, I was scared to death that I was going to flunk out. I was told that 40 to 45 percent of the freshmen flunked out in my, you know, when I was coming to school here. I believe that. I think it was true, actually. Um, I, I was in a room with three, well, there were three of us, and one of them did flunk out, and the other two of us did okay. Um, but we, I was scared to death. I studied my butt off. I worked 20 hours a week in washing dishes in the food service for 90 cents an hour, which was you know, okay back then. And uh, be, because I was scared of flunking out, I, I mean, I never missed a class. I went every time, and I wound up doing you know, pretty well academically. One of you is a member of Phi Eta Sigma. I was a member of Phi Eta Sigma and all that. And I wound up graduating in three years. Uh, the reason for that was because I was scared to death of getting drafted. My father wanted me to go into the Army. My father and I didn't get along, to say the least. And I didn't want to go in the Army, not because I was against the war in Vietnam. It was early days then anyway. But because I just didn't want to waste two years of my life marching around doing nothing of any value. So I decided to graduate in three years. And in doing that, I would take more and more courses every semester. And one semester, I went to the dean, <laughs> and I had signed up for 27 hours. <laughs> and it was on Monday, Wednesday, and Friday. I'd start at 8 o'clock in the morning and finish at 5, not one break during the day, and then Thursday, Tuesday, Thursday, Saturday, and Sunday, I worked at Arby's managing the first Arby's uh, here in Champaign-Urbana, which became the number one Arby's in the country, by the way. <laughs> so after graduating in three years, my draft board thinks I'm still in college, so just by talk about luck and fortune and being in the right place at the right time, the math professors and the electrical engineering professors got together, and all of us who were getting our bachelor's degrees that, that spring, they invited us all in and said, hey, we're starting this new department called the Department of Computer Science. And in order to graduate it, with your master's degree, it'll only take one year all you better to do is take four graduate level math classes that are on this list and four electrical engineering classes that are on this list. 
We'll get for you a Department of Naval Research grant. You'll all work on ILIAC 4, which is the new computer on the drawing boards, and life will be good. And they were so convincing that six of us signed up. <laughs> and sure enough, that all worked out. And so after four years, I've got my, my uh, master's degree. And there's this brand new college starting up in Champaign called Parkland College. And it was, I think, March or April. And they were interviewing. And I went and interviewed. And sure enough, they hired me. I was the fifth professor teacher at Parkland to be hired in the whole history of the school. And so I wanted to get my PhD in math. I always was taught and believed that business people were basically dishonest and made their money by taking from the poor uh, and, and giving to themselves. I was brought up in a blue collar family that thought that way. I, it doesn't have to be that way, and I think we're living proof of that. Um, but I went to Parkland and I was 21 years old the day I started, and somehow I, have a fr I had a friend who pu put me under his wing, and he got me elected president of the faculty when I was 22 years old. Is that crazy or what? And we, Dr. Starkle, who was the first president of Parkland and became a very good friend of mine, we would go to conventions, and there would be a president of the faculties would go here, and the presidents of the school universities or colleges would go over here, and I was always like, are you a student? The students are over there. Um, and it was a really interesting uh, time. Unfortunately, the head of the computer department at Parkland was, um, didn't work out. So Parkland terminated him like three months after the start of the college. And the only person that could spell computer in the whole school now was me <laughs> because of my experience at the U of I. So I was appointed director of the computer center, put on the president's uh, cabinet, and um, that's where my career really got started. So Champaign-Urbana to me is, is uh, so important uh, for that reason. And it set the stage for what I wanted to do because as I got further into my degree and graduated and was at Parkland, WCIA television came to the computer center one day and said, asked me, we'd like to talk to the director. And I said, well, that's me. And WCI hired me to evaluate a computer proposal that was in front of them. They, at the time, WCI was owned by August Meyer, who was one of the 400 wealthiest men in America, right here in Champaign-Urbana at the time. And he owned the Peoria um, CBS station and the San Diego station. He also owned this institution called the Bank of Illinois which is literally the next building over from where the Parkland College Computer Center was on Neal Street downtown. And so I was asked to uh, go to the Bank of Illinois and set them up in the computer business, uh, which I did again. So I had all this great background and uh, coming from a humble beginnings uh, and being able to start a business that I, that was run in a very ethical way, if I don't say so myself. I got a lot of recognition for all that. After all that, we come to my third major objective, and that is I know what it's like to touch a billion dollars. It's a lot of money. I don't have a billion dollars. I lost a lot. We, our company was breached and all that, but did very, very well. But here, I, I, know, I know more than a few billionaires. And, I, and I'm not anywhere near that in terms of my personal wealth, but what I want to ask these people is, so you worked hard to make all this money. What the hell are you going to do with it? Because if you, you, know, you don't think about spending a billion dollars, but if you think about it, you really can't do it unless you're going to go buy Renoir paintings or you know, just do stupid things. Well, maybe that's not stupid, but whatever. Why don't people who make a lot of money, I don't get it, why don't they give back? Why don't they do something, it's not just the money, like Bill Gates, I love Bill Gates, he invented DOS, the greatest thing that ever happened to my career. But why, you know, he is outsourcing the spending of his billions and billions of dollars. If he would put his brain to work on, his, on what he's doing, he would have clear, he would have solved the malaria disease already. Wealthy people 
who are able, to, if they're smart enough and facile enough to be successful in a modern economy, why not put that same talent and ability into solving real significant problems for the underclass and bring up the whole, all the boats that are in the sea? So I want to try to be an example for people who have been very successful to, hey, continue to be successful doing something of value to society. It's just as rewarding if not more rewarding, because you know you're doing something with your time other than building you know, your nest egg that when you die is going to be distributed to your children who don't know what the hell you want to do with your money either. So I've been all over the place with this talk, but it's not two hours, so it's uh, uh, been somewhat successful. I want to recognize some people in the room, and I'm afraid to do this because I want to forget people. But uh, I'd like to introduce Steve Cardamon, who is the founding, Steve, please stand. Steve is, was my first partner in the foundation in Lockport. He was at Lockport Township High School when we started the program back in, what year, Steve? 2006, officially. Officially. When did we do our first scholarships? 03. 03, okay. And then we have Bob Tucker, no relation to the famous Chuck Tucker. Bob Tucker here, and uh, Kevin O'Donnell, who's heads up our mentoring business. We have a number of other folks from the area, but I wanted to introduce these three because they've been our stalwarts. They really invented the scholarship program and did all the heavy lifting. So thank you guys. I've introduced Dirk, I've introduced Rebecca, I've introduced Deborah. I want to introduce Chuck Thompson. You met Chuck, he's been up here. Without Chuck Tucker, we wouldn't be here today. And I want to thank Chuck very much for your tremendous efforts to make this work. And I should be thanking a lot of other people, everybody in the room actually, but uh, it's been a real pleasure. Um, we're going to make this program into one of the best one in the country. Uh, there's a lot of reason to do it. Uh, Dr. Ramage and I are going to cut a, cut a deal at Parkland College uh, to bring in children um, you know, who are um, going to wind up coming to the University of Illinois, many of them, not all of them, but many of them. So I'm excited about that. I'll be back here, and we'll be working. We'll be doing a lot of creative work to make this program a real model for us to follow around the country as we grow the foundation. I, I believe that we can raise money from other people with lots and lots of money to make this a sustainable company and frankly, I've started a new company um, that the, my goal is to, for, for the foundation to own half of it. Actually, it will be a public charity by then. And we're going to build a really great business, and the foundation's going to become a billion dollar foundation because we're going to do this. And we're going to engage a lot of businesses across this country. Uh, we had 350,000 customers at, uh, par at, at Heartland. Um, and we're going to have more than that with the new company, and the benefit's going to go to help the kinds of people that we've been talking about here this morning. So with that, I would like to ask uh, Dr. Jones to come back up here. I have something that I'd like to give to him. It's my pleasure on behalf of the Do Something Back Foundation. Well, it's tough to top that, and uh, and we won't try. So, um, Bob, thank you so much. All the Give Something Back Foundation people, thank you so much. The University of Illinois is just ecstatic to be partnering with you in this effort, and we look forward to continuing to work with you and helping more and more students like the fabulous students we have here today. So that concludes the formal event. Um, please stay and enjoy lunch, and um, enjoy the company of the folks at your table. Thanks for coming. <laughs>